face. He was doing miraculous things, doing infallible things, it says in the book of Acts, just kind of stapling down and, and really um, nailing down who he was, that he had conquered death, he had conquered the grave, he was the king of kings, he was the savior, he was this Messiah that um, God had promised to bring to the earth. But he walked 40 days on the earth, and 40 is, is very important. We'll talk about that just for a moment in a moment. 40 was important. And then the other piece to make it Pentecost, which makes it 50, was 10 days they were in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. So we are exactly 50 days today from Easter Sunday. Because what you do is you count Easter Sunday to this Sunday. You count that day, and to this day is exactly 50 days. Most of you didn't know that, but this is why we call this Pentecost. 50 means Pente is me Pentecost means 50, okay? So I want to go to the book of uh, Acts chapter 1. I want to read some scriptures and kind of set the tone just for a moment. There's another thing that's very incredible about this and kind of shows a merging and in, in a, in a, um, almost like a coalescing of two things coming together. I, I, I won't even try to pronounce it because I would get chided royally from Jason, but... This is also the day of the festival of the giving of the Torah by the Jewish people. So if you think about it, the law was being celebrated on the 50th day, and the Holy Spirit coming is being celebrated on the 50th day, 50th day. So you see exactly a marriage of grace and truth coming together on Pentecost. You see the exact same thing. So there's a, there's a convergence of these two things happening, the Holy Spirit and the law, the, separ the celebration of the Torah. And the book of Acts chapter 1, and I hope we have this on the screens for you, a few scriptures that we're going to read this morning. In verses 3 through 5, I want to read those verses first. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them for forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith, You have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So I want you to see, first off, he makes a difference between water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, you got that? Say water baptism. Say water baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. He makes a difference, okay? Now down to verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So you see this large ring around Jerusalem and, and then Judea and Samaria and the uttermost, this ring, this band just keeps going further and further and further out. But it's, the power comes to us so that we might be witnesses or testimonies of Jesus Christ in the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, You men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing but to heaven? This Jesus, which is taken up from you unto heaven, shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. So we see here, Jesus Christ leaves in a cloud. And if you read in the scripture, it's going to come back in a cloud. But they said, that's not the important thing. The important thing is, is that you need to be about the Father's business. You need to be being sure that you're witnessing to people in the earth. While I stand here gazing up into the heavens, you should be going out and telling others about Christ. Now let's move on down to the book of Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost, the 50 days, was completed, was fully come, they were all together in one place, in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now I think it's kind of an interesting thing here this morning that we have a family of three that are from India. India has many dialects, many dialects. 
many, many dialects. When I was in India some years ago, they said that you could walk across the street and the people would have a different dialect, and you might have to have an interpreter to understand what they were talking about. Is that true, my friend? True. I was in a meeting back in Bible school back in 1977 or 78, and there was a speaker in our, in our conference there. His name was Mickey Mingo. Now, who would ever want to have a name like Mickey Mingo? We call him the m M&M Man, right? And then there was a man there named um, Gladdy Raj, which happened to be from New Delhi. And Gladdy Raj was not speaking that morning. Gladdy Raj was sitting in the meeting. And Mickey Mingo, he's preaching along, preaching along, preaching along. All of a sudden, Mickey Mingo begins to say st these, these words and syllables began to come out of his mouth like nothing I had ever heard before. I'd never heard an Indian pe person speak before. It was, you know, I, 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 it, the best I could say, it sounded almost like gibberish. I didn't, didn't make, couldn't make sense of it. And as he was doing this, I just felt this, this incredible presence of the Lord in the room. And all of a sudden, Gladdy Raj in the back... He stood up and he began to tell each and every one of us what the preacher had just said from the pulpit. Now, I already believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking other tongues, but this was the first time anything like this had ever happened. I had been in meetings where people had been given a supernatural gift of interpretation of someone that had spoken in tongues, but I'd never been in a meeting that was likened to Acts chapter 2, where actually someone heard their language being spoken at the very same time. Now, these two men didn't know each other, but God moved in a supernatural and a sovereign way. And that's exactly what happened here on the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to turn with me quickly just so I can clear one, one little space up here before I move on. In 1 Corinthians 14, 39, I believe I did get that to Katie this morning. I sent it later. 1 Corinthians 14, 39. Now, you have to understand something. I was raised as a Southern Baptist boy down in North Carolina. And we came to church, and I'm not knocking it because it was where I grew up. It was where I got my foundation. It's where I understood, you know, the scriptures. It's where I understood foundation and doctrinal things. It says here, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to do what? Don't say it like you're ashamed. Say what? All right. So we're not ashamed. All right, you can take that down. I didn't know about prophecy. I surely didn't know about speaking in tongues. I did know that people that we called Pentecostal, we considered them crazy. In other words, when they would come to our church at Revival, they might say amen or they might say hallelujah, praise the Lord. And we thought, what's wrong with them? Well, today, this room here will be, I'll say, what's wrong with you? Well, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you responding to something that's being said no different than you going to a football or basketball game and cheering on your team or shouting when something happens that makes you excited. But back to the story, I didn't know anything about prophecy. I didn't know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything about Acts chapter 1. I didn't know anything about Acts chapter 2. I didn't know anything about receiving power and the Holy Ghost to come upon you. All I knew is that you went to church and you, you, did, you know, the, did the stuff and you got water baptized, time, water baptized and you became a member of the church. You gave your life to Christ. That's all I knew. I didn't know there was more than that. So in 1976 thereabouts, my story goes this way. You know, you've heard my salvation story, how I gave my life to Jesus Christ. But maybe you haven't heard this part. This is the part that kind of make, takes me to another level, takes me to a different space, and brings us to the day of Pentecost today. Most of you probably have a story like this, and if you don't, then you can. I'm going to say that again. If you don't have a story like I'm going to tell you, you can have a story like I'm telling you. Number one is, is that Acts chapter 2 is not outdated. All right? It's not something for the past. It's not something that was just for 2,000 plus years ago. It's something that was for, that is for today because God is a present day God. Can you say amen to that? God is present day. God does not age. God does not get old. God is the same age today as he was when he created Adam and Eve in the garden. 
It's the same age. There's no difference in his age. There's no difference in who he is. He is the same. The Bible says yesterday, today, and forever. Do you understand me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing has changed about him. The only thing that changes is us. We're the only ones that change. We're the only ones that, that manipulate or maneuver or, 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 or recategorize things. But the Bible is the Bible. And it never ceases to amaze me. People that believe in the inherent Word of God or the infallible Word of God, they like to cherry pick and cherry pick things out of the Scriptures that help them, but they want to leave and discard things that they don't want to believe for this day because someone told them that it's not for today. But Acts chapter 2, verse 1, uh, cha Acts chapter 1, verse 8... Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is for the church today. Without this, we absolutely are without power. Without this, we are absolutely just treading water until Jesus Christ comes. Wouldn't you rather be walking on water than treading water? If you had a difference to choose between using a spoon to dig a hole or using a backhoe, which one would you want to use? If you had a choice of walking through a mud or a swamp or riding a big four-wheeler through a mud and swamp, which one would you rather have? Come on. If you want, right, you want to have a four-wheeler. If you're going to move a big pile of dirt, do you just want to, you just want to kind of go and, and try to move it by your hand, or you want to have a bulldozer? Which do you want to have? So what Jesus Christ did, he came over and he raised the bar. He gave us exponential power when he came in, in, in the book of Acts chapter 2. He gives us this authority. He gives us a separate power, a new power that we didn't have before. So when I came to, to know Jesus Christ, I was uh, this little, this young Baptist boy that was rooted and grounded and founded in the fastest Bible sword driller in, 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 the, in, the whole, in the whole church. But I didn't know about Acts 1 and 8. I didn't know about Acts chapter 2. So when I was in, by, in, in college at East Carolina University, before I got saved, my buddy and I would go out, and believe it or not, we would go out, and we would play foosball down at the bars, and we would drink pretty bad. Most, many times we'd come home, we were pretty intoxicated, and the craziest things would happen. You know, people do crazy things when they're drinking. Are you with me? No, are you guys all sober? You've never been drunk before? You're, 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 you know, but, but when we were drinking, we would say things and do things that on a normal day we wouldn't do. You remember? If you did drugs, you would, right? You remember, guys, you would say things that you would never do this stuff if you were, like, clean and sober, right? You wouldn't do it. So when, I, when we were sitting there, we were in our bed, in our, in our rooms, we would be, we were, we were drinking pretty good. We were, in, we were pretty good, actually, drunk pretty good. And my friend begins to talk to me about the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the weirdest thing. We're drinking. We're doing something on God. We're drunk. And then my, my friend says, have you ever heard about the Holy Spirit? I said, what? The Holy Spirit? The only Spirit I know about is one in the bottle. That's the Spirit I know about. He says, no, the Holy Spirit. He says, I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, 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 my dad used to take me to these meetings, and, and the Holy Spirit would come, and, and people would just worship the Lord, and they would raise their hands, and they would, they would speak in other tongues. I'm thinking, really? Now, I'm kind of drunk, so it doesn't really affect me. It doesn't really bother me. I'm thinking these people are crazy. I don't think that. I'm just like, oh, okay, that's cool. So fast forward, you know, 1976. I'm in a meeting in Williamson, North Carolina. I'll never forget this. is a restaurant. It's called uh, the Town and Country Restaurant. There were no churches like this to go to, so all the businessmen, all the people that really loved the Lord, they, would, they went to a restaurant, and they, they had an organization called Full Gospel Businessmen. Some of you might remember that, and there's Women's Aglow. Those guys were uh, outside, the local outside of a church because there was no churches. We were in it that would experience, let you experience this and, and, and preach this. So I went to this meeting, and, and this guy talked. I couldn't tell you what the guy's name was. We had a nice dinner, but my, my friend was there, and some other friends was there, and my, my cousin was there. And they would have a, a time of prayer at the end. It says, anybody wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then just uh, come back in the prayer room. We'll have some people pray for you. I said, cool. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, I probably should go, but I won't. I'm not going to do it. I'm just kind of like being stubborn. And nobody here, I'm sure, has ever been stubborn, but I was stubborn. I just sat there. It got so bad, I thought I was the only person left in the room. I thought everyone else had exited the room. I was there in that room, in that restaurant by myself. But I finally looked up. There were still people there, but I was just really feeling convicted. I was really feeling this hunger and this urge of the Spirit of God in my life. And so the next thing that happens, I see my cousin come out of the prayer room. Well, man, she is like glowing. 
I don't mean like she's really glowing, but she like like she's like like so happy and so excited. It's like I thought, what in the world happened? So I grabbed one of the guys. I said, listen, I said, I don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know what she's got. I said, but I want whatever she's got because she looks like she's really happy. She's like she's really, really enjoying the presence of the Lord. So they took me back in the prayer room. Now, you might not understand. I had never been in a church like this. I had never been where you had free worship. I had never been where anything of any uh, outward, you know, expression had been other than just standing up and singing, sitting down, standing up and singing, sitting doing this three times every service. That's all I, that's all I knew about church. So they got me in there, and I, the first person I saw was my roommate's father. Boom. Curtis. Curtis Knox is his name. Curtis Knox had been praying for us two heathen boys. So here I walk in, there's Curtis, and there's another guy that's running the local Christian bookstore. His name is Wayne West. He still lives up in uh, Lancaster, PA. He's still ministering the gospel today, and his wife. Those are the two people I saw, and they just began to pray for me. Well, I'm telling you, man, the weirdest thing began to happen. Kind of like the folks in the book of Acts chapter 2. They thought they were drunk. They thought they were messed up, you know, stuff. They said, they said no, they're not drunk with wine. You're supposed to the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, I began to feel... Very, very weak. The presence of the Lord is descending upon me, coming upon me. And then they said to this, they said, get a chair, get a chair. He's going out. I'm thinking, going out? I don't even know what that's ta- I don't know what they're talking about. I'm just like, wow, this is really cool. I'm just experiencing the presence of the Lord. And they sat me down. And to make a long story short, uh, finally I, I, I got enough strength to get up and, 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 and go home. And that particular night was my first experience getting pulled over by a policeman. I'm racing down the road in North Carolina, in Williamson, North Carolina, and I'm going where they call the underpass, and you're just it's about a 35 mile per hour zone. Well, I'm just a, going a little fast. And it's like. 11 o'clock at night, I just left the meeting. I'm, man, I am so happy. Have you ever been happy when you leave church? And you don't even think about how fast you're driving. You just, you just whoo, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's like almost you're in church driving the car. And, man, that's the way I kind of felt. And all of a sudden, it wasn't blue lights. It was red lights started flashing behind me. I think, oh, my gosh. I pulled over, and I'm happy. I'm just as happy as anybody. I mean, so the guy pulls, come, he says, what's going on? I said, well, I just left church. <laughs> he said, what? I said, yeah, I just left church, man. I said, it's really good. He says, can I see your driver's license, please? <laughs> man, I was so happy. I could have cared if less if he'd have given me a ticket or not. But he comes back. He says, sir, he says, looks like your license is good. You never had a problem, never been pulled over anything like no tickets, no nothing. He says, he says, uh, but, and you've been where? I said, I've been to church. I mean, I'm just like glowing. I'm so happy. I'm so, I've been to church. I mean, I, re, I had been to church like I'd never been to church before in my entire life. This was so good. This was so cool, Irene. I was like, wow. And he says, now, sir, he says, I know you're excited. He says, but can you just kind of keep it down on the way home? I, I said, yes, sir. Thank you very much. And I drove on home. Man, wouldn't you know that when you experience something like that, the first thing that's going to happen is the enemy, the devil, is going to try to rob your joy. Has that ever happened to you? That you, get, you? Maybe you come to church and something powerful happens in your life or the message really ministers to you. And by the time you get down the road, you know, a mile or two, something happens and all of a sudden just, just puts a dark cloud on what you've experienced. Or maybe you go home or something happens during the week and something just, just ruins everything. Has that ever happened to anybody? Wave at me. Yeah, okay, sir, you're in the same ballpark as me. Well, I get home and my dad is not a Christian. My dad is not even close to a Christian. My dad is a heathen, okay? He's a heathen. And I walk in the house, and I'm bouncing all around, and I'm all excited. I said, I just told my dad what had happened to me, and it's like, I don't want to hear it. Get the out of here. I'm thinking, are you serious? This is really good. This is, I mean, I mean, the Lord is really, get out. I don't want to hear it. So I left. I was so bummed out. I was so beaten up. I said, how could somebody not receive this wonderful experience that I had. But you know what? People that don't know the Lord can't experience what you've experienced. 
It brought a whole other level of meaning as I was growing in Christ that says this, do not cast your pearl before swine. You know what that means? Don't give something valuable to someone that does not understand what value is. So I was giving something of value to someone that did not understand what value was. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, make excuse for me. That's just the way it was. And, and that began a whole other story of, of reconciliation down the road and me leaving the house because my Christianity got in the way of my father's lifestyle. Before my dad died, I did find out that he'd given his life to Christ. So it was made, made it very easy to, to preach his funeral for him. But this is real, folks. This is my story. There are many of you here, I could go through this room, and you've had a, you have a story very similar. Same kind of thing happened to you, and you weren't looking for it. You'd never heard about it before, but something was going on, and you really got hungry for God. You really got hungry for God. My wife was a young Catholic girl up in Pittsburgh, raised in a Catholic school, and they had a revival that hit the churches up there. Churches just begin to explode because of the baptism and the Holy Spirit, because of the worship and the praise that we love to cultivate here. I'm saying all this to tell you this is what Pentecost is all about. It's about experiencing the Lord Jesus Christ in another whole level, in another whole space in your life. That you give him something that you've never given him before. That you surrender something to him you've never surrendered to him before. Now, you've got to understand something. Jesus had been on the earth for 40 days after he was resurrected from the dead, doing all kinds of miracles and showing his power in the earth. But the, when he leaves, he says, the power is going to come to you, but you've got to wait in Jerusalem. And these people, 120 of them, gathered in an upper room for 10 days. 10 days. Everybody say 10. So 40 is a pretty important term. is a pretty important set of numbers here. Let me see if I can just help you with this just for a moment. The number 40, if you see in the Scriptures, Moses was 40 years old when he had to leave Egypt. He was in the wilderness for 40 years. Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 is such a, a, a profound number. But 40 is the number of testing. So he tested and been proven, and the probation of his life and resurrection had been absolutely secure for 40 days. But that's only 40. It had to be 50. It had to be Pentecost because it had to, the, the law celebration of the Torah and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit, had to be exactly on the same day. So there had to be 10 more days. So they were gathered together for 10 days. And 10 is a wonderful number because it's a complete number. It's a perfect number. It signifies the creation of God and of man as well as the testimony of the law, its responsibility toward us, and the completeness of God's order in the earth. It's very important. So, we have ten. Four is the number of creation. So, four times ten is what? Forty. And then ten plus forty is what? Fifty making the year of Pentecost. Fifty, Jason mentioned, is the year of forgiveness. It's the year of jubilee. It's the year of harvest. It's the year when the page is turned. It's the year when everything changes. What all that was for 50 years is changed. All that was for 50 days is changed. Something brand new is about to happen. So I can say this today. We're celebrating 50 days after Easter. So we can say this very definitively. You can have something fresh and new happen to you today because tomorrow is the 51st day or it's the beginning of another day. It's the beginning of something brand new. Amen? Something brand new. So when they hit the streets on the 50th day, 3,000 people get saved. They heard people speaking in other tongues from every nation the face of the earth, and they heard them praising and worshiping God in their own language. Why is this important? It's the birth of the church. It was the birth of, of God displaying and, dis, and dispensing His glory in there so people could have the power to do the things they needed to do to witness for Jesus Christ and also to cause people's heads to be turned from looking that way to looking this way. Can I tell you this? When the day of Pentecost came, people were, that were looking that way. When they heard that, they began to look this way. So when God moves on a life, it's to get someone's attention, not only yours, but someone else's. Now, we read the verse. 
It said this, cover the prophesy and forget, forbid not to speak with other tongues. I just want to let you know something. They spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 as the Spirit of God gave utterance. It's available today just like it was then. Why? 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 Because God never changes. Why? Because God is eternal. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not something where you come up here and someone would pray for you and you just repeat what they say. It's just the Spirit of God gives you utterance. So now you've heard my story. So why is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, why is this day of Pentecost so important? I'm going to give you four quick little things here, and then I'm going to let you go. Everybody say amen. amen. You're not too excited? Okay. You know, this morning I read a Google report on our church. And I don't know when this guy, this guy said he came to church. He said, well, we're very unfriendly very unwelcoming, and that our service went for three hours. We haven't had a three-hour service in years. This could be the day. I don't know. I mean, I've been in services with longer than three hours. Some of y'all remember those days. Yeah, you remember those days. I know Brandis remembers those days. I know Jason as a kid remembers it. I know Dementis remembers it. I know Linda Horton remembers it. I know Carol Brown remembers those days. That we were, Three hours was nothing. The, the, the Hales remember those days, right? It was nothing. And the thing with it is, you didn't want to leave. So I'm not propping us up to this thing, but it's like I was like saying, what are you talking about? So I just asked him, could we some way, somehow just meet and talk? Since you are some way, somehow completely... Missed who we are. Maybe you went to a different open door church. I don't know. There are others, believe it or not. Number one, the reason this day is so important is because it should remind us and it ought to remind us. Let me say this we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, December the 25th, right? That's when we celebrate, okay? I don't care if that's the right day or not. That's the day we celebrate it, okay? The Christian world celebrates it the 25th. But when I first got saved and first, you know, came into the church, it's like every day is really Christmas, right? Isn't every day really Christmas? It should be. Every day is because Jesus Christ should be coming to your life fresh every day. There should be something birthed in your life because of Christ every single day. I think Jesus alluded, I mean, Jason alluded to that. The second thing is this, is Easter we celebrate it once a year. It varies the time we celebrate it. But really, we should celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every day we get up. Because His love and His mercies are new, what? Every single day, right? So we should, Easter, Christmas should be every day. Easter should be every day. But the day of Pentecost should be every day. Why? Because that is a time where we experience the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. His presence in our life, His presence in the earth, and the power of His Spirit. The way that we should live is under His power, experiencing His presence and His Spirit every single day. Has, you know what it's like when you, don't have a day, when you have a day where you don't experience His presence? How bad is it? How bad is it? But God wants us to experience His presence every day. And this should be a reminder that we need to experience His presence every day. Well, how does that happen? You have to be set and available for it to happen. You have to be in the posture to experience His presence. So it's a reminder that we can experience His presence and His power every single day. Not just like they did them 2,000 years ago, but right now. God never ages. I want to say it again. God never ages. We can have this in our lives right now, right today, and tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. You can live in a different way than you've been living. So we, number one is that we can experience the presence and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can uh, have strength in life, that we can have comfort in life, we can be encouraged in life, and that He can help us overcome the difficult times and the problems that we have and maybe the things that we deal with and fight with, but we can overcome that because of His presence. We need His power. We need His strength because we cannot do it in our own. The second thing is this, is that we need the church to have more of a central role in the world we live in. The church should be the center of the world, not 
outside. It should be the reason everything is happening. Everything is moving, but it's not. We have removed the church from the center of the stage. We've allowed it to happen. It's our responsibility as a church to put the church back in the center of the stage. That we stop apologizing for being Christians. That we stop apologizing for believing. That we stop apologizing for praying. That we stop apologizing for living the Christian life tenets in the world we live in. I don't care what the world says. I'm still going to live the way the Bible says. But this is the way everybody else is doing it. I don't care how everybody else is doing it. This is not a lemmings contest, folks. This is a Christian deal. We're not just going to follow somebody over the cliff just for the sake of following them. We're going to put our foot down, and we're going to live life the way the Word of God says to live. Are you with me? The church was the center of the world this day. The whole world listened when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Preachers, Peter preached this denier, this denier of Jesus Christ. 3,000 people get saved. And you know the story. The church multiplied. And the church was added to daily such as be saved. Listen, you either add to the church or you take away from the church. What do you want to do? You either add or you take away. You're either adding or subtracting. You either multiply or you divide. What are you doing? Are you adding to the church? Then add to the church. But don't subtract from the church. Don't divide the church. They came together in unity. They came together in one. And when they came together as one, God moved and God did something. The church agreeing together. One will chase a thousand what? Two shall chase ten thousand, right? Right? The power of people coming together, the power of unity, the power of being in one accord. Number three, that the church, literally, the church is a multicultural entity in the earth. It always was. Why? It says because everyone that was gathered together in the city at that particular time heard God's name proclaimed and been praising God. Every single nation was there, folks. Every people group was there when this happened. When I was a kid in the Little Baptist Church, before there was an integration of schools, come on, we sang the song, Jesus loves the little children. Come on. All the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Who remembers that? You did a good job. We sang that in the little church where I was raised, a little brick church, a little white church in North Carolina. And they probably sang it in the little black churches and the little Asian churches and all the other different groups of people. They're all probably saying their own individual segregated churches. But we were singing an integrated song. Hello, we were singing a song of integration, a song of combination, a song of blending us together from the very beginning, and yet God and let people had us separated. I want you to look around this morning, and you can see people from all over, literally the world here this morning, because we have friends from India. Come on. Yeah, we have friends from India here today. And Jesus loves them as much as he loves us. It's just not an American gospel. It's not just an Indian gospel. It is a gospel for the world. This is for the world. This is not just for one people group. This is for the world. Come on. And we are destined, and we are, uh, uh, what should I say, we're, we're supposed to prompt and promote this in the world. And where's the world? You don't have to go across the water anymore to be in the world. The world came to you. You live in the midst of the world. You don't have to go very far to see Indian people anymore. You don't have to go very far to see Islamic people anymore. You don't have to go very far to see Japanese or Chinese or Asian. You don't have to go very far. Just go, just go a few miles down the road, and you'll see all those people. You might see them today in the supermarket. You might see them at work tomorrow. Some of you work with all kinds of different people. But the church... Because of Pentecost, because of Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. He came that day to pour His Spirit out on not just those 120, but on the entire world that was gathered that day. Because why? God is not a respecter of persons. There's neither male nor female, Jew, Greek, Gentile, barbarian, Scythian. There's none of those differences in the kingdom of God. We're all 
one because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Come on. Hallelujah. And then finally, he came the day of Pentecost to help us understand that this thing called the church, this thing called ministry, needs every single working part. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about us being the body. It talks about us being many parts. And that this part doesn't say, I don't have neither that part. And this part that's less comely doesn't say, or be is not jealous of the persons or the part that's more uncomely. But we all are a part. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that every joint supplies. Every single person does their part. Every single person comes together and becomes a part of what God is doing. That was what this day of Pentecost was all about as well. Because when you got 3,000 3, people get saved, what's the next thing that's got to happen? What's the next thing that happens if you get them saved? You've got to get them water baptized, right? How can one man baptize 3,000 people? So all of a sudden, probably the rest of the disciples were helping baptize and then they got to have 3,000 people that want to get filled with the Holy Ghost. So guess what? They probably got those 120 in the upper room praying for the 3,000 people to get filled with the Holy Ghost. So there's things for everyone to do. If you read on, there was, time, there, was a, there was a time where they needed somebody to take care of the widows. So they had to set some guys up to take care of the distribution of the funds for the widows, for the Greek and the Jewish ladies. Because they're arguing about that. And if you keep on reading, you saw how the ministry began to multiply and how God began to bring more and more and more and more into the fold to begin to minister the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 4.11, he says, that he says, Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, what? For the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, till we all come to the unity of the faith, that God was beginning to pick out and pull out and use people of all different spaces, all different callings of God to help fulfill and help put this church together. So the inclusive work of the ministry in the earth had to happen, and this is when it started on the day of Pentecost. Your motivational gifts, the things that you do, the things that you get the most joy and the most um, fulfillment out of, are probably things that were birthed on the day of God's presence coming to your life. So I would just like to say this morning, the day of Pentecost was a day of radical change for the people in that day. And the day of Pentecost, which we celebrate today, could be the beginning of a great change for you. Some of you have been listening to me today in such a way I've never seen you listen to me. There's people here paying attention to me today. I've never seen you pay attention to me quite like this. You know why? Because there's something yearning, there's, some, there's a desire in your heart for exactly what I'm talking about. Because, listen, folks, you can come to church on Sundays. You can come to church with your family. You can come to church with your wife. You can sing all the songs. You can put your money in the play. But still yet, there's something missing. Still something missing. Until you experience the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're just filling a space. You're just sitting in a, in a seat. You're singing the songs. You're, I say it this way, not condemnation, but you're going through the motions. It's going through the motions. I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to be a puppet on a string, right? I don't want to be a, a, um, a puppet with a hand. Somebody else moving me around. I want the Holy Spirit to move in my life. I want the precious Holy Spirit that we sang about in all these songs this morning. They, you know what, can I tell you something? They put that song list together before I even said anything about it. Pentecost. They did. They put, I said, they had the song list together. How wonderful it is when God orchestrates and puts everything together before you ever say anything. You had no idea those songs were on the list. I didn't know those songs were on the list until I looked and then I said, oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> you know, it's Pentecost Sunday. You know why this is so incredible? Because God is always ahead of us. <laughs> Come on. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows the first and the last. He's the Alpha and the Omega, so nothing surprises him. He knew what was going to happen. When I was preaching in Detroit a few weeks ago, I preached on redemption last week. I preached it on there, up there. But every song they sang was about redemption. 
I wrote every song they did down when I, while they were doing praise and worship, and I went through every single song. I said, every single song is about redemption. See, God, God wants to move in, in, in ways that just will astound and amaze you, but you have to be open. You have to be hungry. You've got to want it to happen. So I want us to stand to our feet right now. Um, Jason or Brandis, one of y'all come play something for me. Play that song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here if you can. And I just, I, you know, I just want us just to take a moment. Just kind of, just don't look at me. Don't look at anybody else. Just, just, just close your eyes just for a moment. Hallelujah. You're here for a reason. You're here to hear something that, that you needed to hear. You're here to know that God wants to do something special in your life. You're here because He wants to pour out in you fresh and anew. You're here because He wants to give you power to overcome. He wants to give you power to help you in the weak areas of your life, the areas you've been struggling in. He's got you here today to help you understand and to clear up even the question about whether this is really true, whether this is really real today. Salvation is not a problem to you, but this other stuff has been a problem. It's been an issue with you. I tell you, if you get this issue straight, it's going to take care of all the rest of the issues. Hallelujah. That you understand that God wants to draw us together. God is trying to put us together. God is trying to, to marry us one to another in, in, in relationships. And that God wants to feed with the Holy Spirit. God wants you to have this exact thing we're talking about, that you'd be not only baptized in water. And I just want to say this. If you're here today, keep your head bowed. Just keep your head bowed. If you've never been baptized in water, you're missing out on a very vital part of your, of your Christian walk. It said they were baptized in water that day. Baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to call the office this week. And if you've never been baptized in water, you say, and, and call and say, listen, I want to set up a day where I can be water baptized. And, and you might be thinking, well, you know what? When I was a kid, when I was 12 or 13 in the church, I got water baptized. But you don't really remember what it was all about. You just did it because maybe somebody else did it because it was that season in the, in the church or uh, someone kind of prompted you to it. Or you thought that that's the way you became a member of the church is water baptism. That, that, that doesn't work. That's not, you just need to erase that and say, listen, I want to do this again and fresh. If you were raised in a church, you know, as a kid and, and they, you say, well, they, we did communion. We did dedication. That's not water baptism either. It says Jesus went down in the water and he came up out of the water. It likens baptism as a death, a burial, and a resurrection. I'll never forget some years ago, I remember this called Cynthia Griffin was in a church. We were in the other building over there, and we didn't even have the building finished. You remember this, Cynthia? We didn't have the building finished, and somebody wanted to get water baptized in the pool. And before that night was over, about 20-some people came. There was like a constant line. We had, we had ropes for people to put in towels. A few years ago, Jason did water baptism because of kids that had never been water baptized at Regent University. I think they did 40 or 50 that night before you were over. And, but once one got baptized, they started lining up. They didn't even have no clothes to change into. It was right in front. They just went right down the water with the clothes they had on. Not even any towels. I was at a church in Nashville a few years ago. They did water baptism in a cow trough in the church. A stainless steel cow trough. And they said, if anybody here has never been water baptized, you want to be water baptized, just come on up right now. They had extra towels, and people just become to get water baptized. So if you've never been water baptized, and, or maybe you weren't, you didn't understand it. I want to encourage you to call and get water baptized. Make an appointment. We'll fill this pool up. And if we have to, I don't care if it's three or one or 101, we'll baptize every one of them. We'll baptize them until the thing dries up. We'll water baptize them. Maybe you've been water baptized and you've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'd like to ask um, Sister Linda Horton, Sister Deb Fowler, Richard and Leanne Pullen to come to the front. And I want you to face the congregation. Jen Menta, John Mark Menta. 
Cynthia Griffin. I'm going to call some odd people right now. Sherry Jernigan. Jerry Namie Cogshaw. Linda and Sue Cavaney. Lonnie and Donna Hale. Pravash and Amber. These people are going to be standing at the front of the room. Mike and Connie Mulholland. <clears throat> Just stand across here. Now you obviously see there's males and females up here. And I'm just going to invite you. You've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know how many people are here. That's why I call so many people up. You've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor, what they're talk, what you talk about today, I want some of that. I'm saved. I know Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, but I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just want you to begin to make your way up here right now. So that these people can pray for you. Quickly come. I believe there's people in this room right now that need to come to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on. Here comes one. There's two more back in the back coming. Anyone else? They're going to pray for you. They'll just pray for you and just believe the Lord to move in your life. Anyone else? There's two over here. There's one over here. Y'all can pray with them jointly together. Anyone else? You can experience the presence of the Lord in a whole nother dimension. Come on, Brother Lonnie. Grab this guy right here. Sister Donna, grab this girl right here. Yeah, Sister Linda, you can pray with them too. Yeah. Get a couple there together. Anyone else? Anyone else? Come on, anyone else? Be prayed for for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. My keyboard quit. Anyone else? Now, you know what this means, right? That you've been, you, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit... Is about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's about the evidence of speaking out of the tongues happening in your life. Anyone else need prayer this morning for this? Anyone else? I know everyone here is not filled with the Holy Spirit. I promise you. Here she comes. Here comes another one. Praise the Lord. I mean, if you're weeping and your chest about to come out of your, your heart's about to come out of your chest, you need to be up here. Come right here. Right here. Come on, Leanne and Debbie, right here. Come and meet you right here. Come over here. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Sister Sherry, just come pray with her right here. Just come right here and pray with her. Anyone else? Can we sing that song? Are you here for prayer? Yeah, right here with John, Mark, and Jerry. It's pretty good little Come here, come here, Pravash. Right over here. And, J and Michael. Yeah, there you go. Now, Lord, we just come in Jesus' name. We just pray for all these that are at the front, Lord. And, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name right now, Father. God, that you would begin to move upon their hearts. Lord, that you begin to fill them with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Lord, let that river of God, Lord, begin to spring up in their bellies, Father. Begin to flow out of them, Father. God, they begin to sense the refreshing of the Holy Spirit, Lord. God, that you just begin to open their mouths, Father. Lord, and cause, Lord, that prayer, that heavenly language, Father. Lord, that four-wheel drive language, Father. Lord, begin to come out of their mouths, God. Lord, that backhoe language, God. Lord, that language, God, of power. That language, God, that will build them up like nothing else, Father. Hallelujah. Lord, that language, God. Lord, that would be the perfect prayer, God. That would communicate, Lord, directly with your spirit, God. Lord, without any other language, Lord, except that heavenly, precious, heavenly language, God. We pray that you baptize them, God, right now in the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, that they feel your power, that you overcome them, Father, right now. God, that they feel Lord, Lord overwhelmed, Father, by your presence. Hallelujah. Overwhelmed by your presence, Lord. Overwhelmed by your presence. Hallelujah, Lord. Just begin to move and stir their beings, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. We welcome you, Lord, in this place, Lord, right now. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just come. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Just lift your hands up. And just you, right where you're at, just begin to receive fresh from the Lord. Just begin to receive from Him. Just say, right where you're at, say, Lord, I want to be refreshed, Lord God. I need your presence in a fresh new way, God. Lord, I need, Lord, to, to close a door on the past, God. Lord, I need something new in my life, Lord. I need a new beginning, a new start in my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Can we sing that song, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here? If you start it, I'll sing it. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living host. Your presence. Come on, sing it. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord just listen to this real quietly there's somebody in here that's been praying for a long time to be healed today is the day God wants to hear you. So we just ask you come up, let somebody put their hands on you, anoint you, and you, God's going to heal you today. A long-term long illness. They've been praying for a long time for God to heal it. And you keep thinking that God's not listening, but he is listening, and he wants to heal you today. And so if you have a long-term illness, something you've been praying about or fighting with, you need prayer, here comes a lady right now. Hallelujah. Right here. Come here. Come here, Linda. You can pray for this young lady. Hallelujah. This is Brooke. Just pray for her. Thank you, Lord. Long-term illness. We pray for a miracle over here. Anyone else need prayer this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anyone else need prayer this morning? Anyone else? Come on. Don't go anywhere, girls. Come on, Katie. Have another one. Oh, yeah, you do have a long-term illness, don't you? Okay, yeah, Hashimoto's right here. Okay, wait, I need two ladies here, over here with her. And then I need two ladies here. She's got Hashimoto's, and she's tell you what's going on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone else need prayer this morning before we go? I promise we won't keep you here for three hours. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, make no mistake. I'm talking about salvation, and I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking other tongues. Your prayer language, the perfect prayer, a prayer of you building up yourself in the most Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, in, the, in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Just when you make opportunity, because I don't want anybody hitting at the door and say, I should have been there. Anybody got a long term sickness they need prayer for? Anybody else want prayer this morning? And I'll tell you this, if you need to think about this and be marinating in this, that's fine as well. We have no problem with that. Amen. So let's pray. Everyone, let's pray. Let's lift our hands up and pray. Father.
We come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the celebration of Pentecost Sunday. We thank you, God, that there's people at this altar, God, that have been touched. Lord, you descended upon them, God. Lord, you have, Lord, moved upon their life in special ways, Lord. I, I see tears here, God. I, I believe there's people who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, Lord. You've given a word of knowledge, Lord, about uh, a long-term uh, disease, Father, and sickness. And there's three people that responded to that. So, God, we pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would just begin to move upon the sick ones, God. But I pray, God, that you put a hunger in your people's hearts, God. Lord, that they would just understand that you, if they receive what we're talking about, they could worship at a whole nother level. Something so dynamite would happen in their life. Something so dynamic would happen, Lord, that God, it would just amaze them. And they'd, begin to, they'd be able to talk to people, Lord, about the wonderful work of Jesus Christ in our lives. God, we thank you today. We bless you, Lord. We give you honor, God, because you have moved, Lord, upon the hearts of people, Lord. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to bless as we go. Lord, protect us, Lord. Let your face shine upon us, God. Lord, and refresh us, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. amen. Now, don't forget there's class for FPU tonight. Next Sunday night we're going to be having prayer. But I want you to do this before we leave. I want you to find someone. I want you to hug them. I want you to love on them. Tell them you love them. Okay, God bless you. See you next week. And invite someone to come with you.